I was so sick of being watched all the time. I mean, I couldn't do anything. And, and even though, I mean, my parents had my location on my phone, they would watch me anytime I went out. Like, even though I was being watched so closely, I couldn't do anything even if I wanted to. And that being true, there were still rumors going around, people still talking about it. And it, it's like, I can't, what can I do at that point? I can't do anything. I just have to sit here and listen to people talk about me. Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Attic. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome onto the channel, Ty, who is like me, a fellow ex-Jehovah's Witness. Hello, Ty. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm very well, thank you. I'm, I'm getting to know uh, interview by interview, you and your family, yes. because uh, I've already interviewed your father, Matthew Williams, who is a dear, sweet guy. Yeah. And he told this incredible story about how you guys took a car journey or, or a journey in yeah. his truck or something. Yeah. And, you know, you were able to kind of come to this realization that neither of you believed. Is that right? Yeah, it was, it was, that car ride was one of the scariest, <laughs> like most intense things ever, because I guess it was the most unexpected. Like I never in my life did I think that something like that was going to happen. So I'm sitting in the car and my dad in so many words is telling me that he doesn't want to do this. And it, I just felt like I was like not in the room. You know what I mean? I was like, is mm. he really saying this? Is this real? Like, it was like an out of body experience. And I know that sounds dramatic, but seriously, it mm. was just, I almost couldn't, I just started crying. It was too much. It was just mm. looking back on it now, realizing I just didn't know that that car ride was going to make such a difference in my life. And it changed everything. So it was really insane. Wow, I can imagine. If if yeah. Tibor is gracious, we will get a thumbnail just so people can watch the watch yeah. the prequel yes. um, <laughs> to, to this interview if they feel so inclined. Yeah. Um, so uh, why don't you back up and uh, let us all know how you, from your perspective, how you first became involved with Jehovah's Witnesses? Yeah. So it's it's a lot like other people. I mean, my parents were raised pretty much in the the truth. I almost said the truth. Um, my dad came in and again, your viewers can watch his video, which I recommend because it's amazing. Mm. Um, but my dad came in when he was like 10, 12, I think. And my mom came in when, uh, she was like maybe two or three and, um, they were both, their parents were both found in the ministry, you know? Um, and I just remember, you know, my mom was a pioneer, like a regular pioneer when I was a kid. Um, so I remember being in the car all the time in service, you know, going here and there and going to doors. And, um, you know, I did a lot of assembly parts and things like that. I remember one assembly part. I was I woke up the morning of the part and I had a fever of like 100 and something. And I was really sick and we just couldn't find anybody else to do it. And I was like, I don't even know. I'll have to ask my parents. I was probably like eight or 10. And I just toughed it. And I got up there and I did my assembly part. And then we went straight home. Like we were. You could have collapsed on the stage. I could you... have, but I powered through, Lloyd. So <laughs> we were we were just that serious about it. You know what I mean? We could have like, said, oh, this she's overwhelmed by Holy, Holy Spirit or something. <laughs> exactly. Wow. So yeah. yeah. So that's how serious we took this. And even I, as a kid, like I was even super sick with probably the flu or something was ready to get up there and do this. Cause I mm. get that seriously at such a young age, um, mm. which I look back now and that's just crazy, but um, yeah. So, so it was pretty, we were very involved. And then I, we ended up moving to Arkansas when I was um, 16, we just didn't really feel like we fit in, in Missouri. There was the congregations there were very, um, there was a lot of like little clicks and things. And if you didn't fit in, you just didn't fit in. Uh, and we didn't fit in. <laughs> and I felt like it was just me that thought that. But looking back now, I realized my parents and my brother felt the same way, which is why we moved. So then we moved to Arkansas. So, yeah, it's interesting how even though it's supposed to be like um, a universal family and mm -hmm. you're supposed to, in theory, kind of turn up anywhere in the world and it's supposed to be the same 
um, you know, even within the confines of, of a country territory, you yeah. can find that the different parts are have a slightly different take on the religion than others to the point where you can, like you say, have have cliques and have clans almost within congregations. And if you, if you don't fit in, then you're treated as an outsider, even though you're doing everything right. So I, I do relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not fun feeling like an outsider. So we moved, we moved to Arkansas to mm. be closer to um, my dad's family who unfortunately doesn't speak to us anymore because we're not witnesses. So there's there's that we don't have our family yeah. which is you know really just is awful but um so we moved to Arkansas um and I was like 16 and I started auxiliary pioneering pretty much right when we moved here I mean things were going great we felt like we fit in for for a, for a minute you know and you know things were just going really good I was auxiliary pioneering and then I ended up meeting Eli who is my husband now um and it was just insane like we weren't even actually dating because I wasn't allowed to date I wasn't old enough I was 17 when you say you met him was he in the congregation um <laughs> I met him because one of my friends used to like him actually and that didn't work out because she was way too young so um we just started talking and just became friends first. We were hanging out in the same friend group because I wasn't old enough to date. I was 17. So um, we weren't dating. We were just hanging out in the same group. And I remember the rumors immediately started, like immediately, and that we were sleeping together, that we were living together, that we were doing this and this and this. And um, so anyways, we, we did end up eventually dating and getting married but during all these rumors going around um I had been auxiliary pioneering and I it my goal was to regular pioneer and get married because so I was homeschooled so I had time to I had graduated at this point so I was full time what I was doing was auxiliary pioneering um and so my goal was to regular pioneer. And so the time came, me and my brother both put in our applications to regular pioneer at the same time. We were in the same congregation and we had both been working towards this goal. We were so excited. We put in our applications. Um, his application got approved. Mine did not. My brother's younger than me. So I figured for sure I was going to get to to regular pioneer. Um, but I didn't. And the elders never even came to me and told me why my application was denied. They told my dad and my dad was an elder. So they told my dad and my dad told me, which just really made me mad because I was like, am I not, am I not grown up enough? Am I not, you know, why can't you? You don't even qualify to be treated with respect. Exactly. Apparently. Yeah. It's yeah. So frustrating. So they said that the reason why I wasn't allowed to regular pioneer was because some of the rumors that had been going around about me and Eli. And I was so, so upset. It shot me down. Like I was so discouraged because I can't control what people are saying. I was going to all the meetings. I was going out in service every day during the week. I was, I was being a perfect witness, you know what I mean? And not doing anything wrong. <laughs> we mm. weren't, we weren't even dating yet. We were just hanging out in the same group. Mm. People just couldn't deal with that apparently. Um, so yeah, the, the rumors are going around. We, we end up, getting married. It all happened kind of quickly. Uh, I met him in December. We started dating in March as soon as I turned 18, <laughs> because finally that was my parents rule. When you turn 18, we can't tell you what to do anymore. So as soon as I turned 18, we started dating. Um, and then in May we got engaged and in September we got married. So in less than a year, I met and married my husband. So that was crazy. I will say that. I understand why people were throwing a little bit of a fit and saying things. But when you're, you know, a witness and you're stuck in your parents' house, you kind of want to get away from that. And I didn't realize what it was I was trying to get away from. I realized now I was trying to get away from being a witness, but I didn't realize that at the time, I think. But 
Anyway, yeah, so- that's what I was going to ask was, you know, obviously, you know, I've, I've spoken before on the channel about, you know, the, the sexual repression element and the fact yeah. that um, that whole side of your life is is crushed, essentially. You know, oh, yeah. you're told, um, you know, that you're not allowed to um, be unevenly yoked with an unbeliever. Uh, you're told that you're not allowed to have sex before marriage. You're told that you're not allowed to be gay. You're told that you're not allowed to look at porn. You're told that you're not allowed to masturbate. So, um, you know, presumably all of these rules had at least some bearing on, you know, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but yeah. the, the speed with which you entered into this. Yeah, well, I was, I was so sick of being watched all the time. I mean, I couldn't mm. do anything. And and even though, I mean, my parents had my location on my phone, they would watch me anytime I went out. Like, even though I was being watched so closely, I couldn't do anything even if I wanted to. And that being true, there were still rumors going around, people still talking about it. And it, it's like, I can't, what can I do at that point? I can't do anything. I just have to sit here and listen to people talk about me. Mm. Even though I'm trying my hardest to follow all the rules, which isn't easy to do. I mean, it's ridiculous going out to dinner with your fiance and my little brother has to come because I'm not allowed to be alone with him in public. You know what I mean? It's like oh, the chaperone thing. Yeah, I remember yeah, it's that. So yeah. stupid. It's just so stupid. So we end up, you know, we're engaged, we're getting married. And um I it was never said, but I feel like we almost weren't allowed to get married in the Kingdom Hall because a family member of mine um went behind our back and went to the brother who was giving our wedding talk and told him that he should reconsider giving our talk because we were living together. We were not living together. <laughs> we were not living together. Um, what had happened was I had signed a lease with him for an apartment because in about a month, I was going to be moving in and paying rent. So my name was going to be on the lease. I wasn't living there, mm. nothing. And so that was a rumor. So because that family member approached him, and said that he wants, you know, he should reconsider giving our talk. He had us over for dinner to question us. And I didn't realize at the time that that's what was happening. I thought he was just having us over for dinner. Um, so we go over there, we drive separate cars, me and Eli, we drive separate cars to their house and we get there and we're having dinner and we're done eating and everything. And it was extremely awkward. The brother asks his family to leave. And then we're just sitting there. And we're like, we know something's getting ready to happen, but <laughs> so we're just sitting there at the kitchen table and his whole family gets up and leaves. And I don't remember how he started the conversation, but basically point blank, he said, are you guys having sex? And I was like, I know, no, we've been asked this many times. We've been, I mean, we had been asked that many times and I said, no we're not, we're not. And he's like, okay, well, I heard, I heard that you guys are living together. And I said, no, we're not living together. You can call my dad right now and ask him I'm living in his house. Mm. Um, I signed a lease because I'm going to be paying rent there. I signed yeah. a lease because I'm getting married in like a month mm. and I, I'm going to be living there. So my name needs to be on the lease. That's all that happened. And he's like, okay, well, you know, and then basically just told us that we we should watch our conduct and how we're acting in front of others. Basically, we shouldn't be sitting together at meeting because it's it's started rumors. We shouldn't be holding hands because you choose to get married and you're not allowed to sit together at the meeting. Oh my okay. gosh. And the thing yeah. was, I had moved to his congregation where I didn't know anyone. So who else mm. might I sit by? My mm. boyfriend. I'm not gonna just be the weird girl that sits by herself. You know what I mean? Mm. Because to be frank, that conversation that congregation wasn't very welcoming to me yeah so I didn't feel like I could just go and sit with someone you know what I mean so I sat with my boyfriend and we continued to sit together even after he had this talk with us because we just thought it was stupid I was like we're not we're in a room full of people with the lights on what do you think mm. we're gonna do like just like we're just sitting next to each other so it was it was I feel like we almost weren't allowed to get married in the hall, if that makes sense, because people were so 
But well, you did, did get married at, in the hall. Unfortunately, we did. Oh, right. I, I okay. can take that back now. But yes, we did get married in the Kingdom Hall. That brother did give our talk. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Wow. We're married by this point. Yeah. You, you did mention. I hope you don't mind me just taking no, you back ahead. to you you being homeschooled. Now. Yeah. You know this is this is quite a common thing among people who are raised in you know Jehovah's Witness families are you able to talk us through the thinking behind your parents taking you out of school yeah so for me I feel like it was more of a I I've always had a lot of um, anxiety problems and we you know we didn't know that as a kid um, because we just mental health in the last 10 years or so has really become something that you can talk about. But even just when I was a kid, it it wasn't. So it wasn't something that my parents or I realized I had. Um, But I would have panic attacks a lot. And I would, you know, I would always feel really sick. And I realize now that that has a lot to do with growing up as a witness. I was always terrified of Armageddon coming and that I was going to die, or I was terrified of this or that. So going to school was just like, you know, the icing on the cake. I was terrified to tell people I was a witness. I couldn't celebrate birthdays. I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. People are always questioning me. And it just gave me this overwhelming anxiety. And it was so hard for me to stick up for Jehovah. You know what I mean? So we, I I just asked my parents one day if I could be homeschooled. And they said, well, actually, we've already been thinking about that. And then, you know, lo and behold, a couple of years later, I think, I mean, it takes some time to get all that arranged and decide to act. It costs money, you know, but mm. we ended up doing it. I was homeschooled for high school. Um, so I went to middle school and I did all that. But it started when right before we moved to Arkansas, I think, is when I started homeschooling. Um, and then I whipped through that pretty quick and finished it so that I could pioneer that was mm. cool. so it really pushed me further into the witnesses I think if I had gone to public school longer um who knows my outcome may have been different because I would have been exposed more to people who weren't witnesses so I'm sure that that plays a big part in a, why a lot of witness kids are homeschooled mm. you know it, it keeps you closer to the organization for sure do you have any regrets about being homeschooled um yes And no, I, you know, everything happens, in my opinion, everything happens for a reason. So if Mm -hmm. I went to school, I wouldn't have got married young and I wouldn't have my son and my husband. But I also missed out on a lot of public school things. I didn't have a lot of friends. I didn't, you know, I I missed out on a lot. And I am, Mm. I am upset about that. But, you know, 50. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You you can. You can lose yourself down the what if rabbit hole, can't you? Yeah, um, exactly. Especially so. when you've left something like this. I feel like it just boggles my mind, the what ifs. It's it's yeah. kind of scary. <laughs> so you're you know, coming back to your story, you're you finally uh, get married, um, you know, despite incredible judgmentalism and yeah. uh, intrusiveness by uh, not just ordinary Jehovah's Witnesses, but even your family members. And so um, how do you go from, you know, reaching this point where you're you're married and you're um, you're in the congregation and hopefully have a little bit more respect Mm. uh, to realizing that none of it's true? Yeah. You would think we would get more respect. That's oh, right. Okay. Where my story continues. <laughs> okay. So uh, we, we were married at this point. Um, I will, I, I do need to start talking about my husband's side of this a little bit, I guess. My okay. And um, when we, when it happened before I even met him, his mom was disfellowshipped, um, which was just extremely hard on him because his, him and his mother are so close. It's, it's, you know they're, they're very, very close. So it was, I constantly, he would talk about how much he missed his mom. And I can see even before we got married, how hard it was on him having his mom not there. I mean, he couldn't talk to her and, you know, he was required to shun his mother. Yeah. Which was mm. extremely hard on her. Uh, Cause we have a relationship with her now, which I'll get to later, but hearing her side of it is just brutal. I can't imagine my son not speaking to me. It, it would just tear me apart. 
Mm. Um, so we're, we're married. His mom's already disfellowshipped about like maybe two months after we got married. I mean, it was right after we got married, his sister left, um, and went to live with her mom. So Eli was heartbroken. His sister's disfellowshipped. Now he's only got his dad. Um, and then probably, I don't know, it's kind of hard this timeline, eight months or a year later, his dad was disfellowshipped. So he has like no one except for me, like his family is gone. And I, you know, I watched him go from the happiest, most positive ministerial servant to someone who doesn't even want to go to meetings, doesn't want to talk to anyone. He's just like, I I hate to say this, but he, it sounds awful, but he was like a shell of Mm. the guy that I met. Well, it's understandable, you know, having been cut off from your family. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love him so much. And it was so hard for me to watch him be in so much pain and I couldn't do anything about it. Um, So, you know, it's hard for either of us to go to meeting because every time we do, people are questioning us. Oh, how's Eli's parents? How's Eli's sister? I'm like, I don't know. Like they're disfellowshipped. I'm not supposed to talk to them either. Stop, like quit asking. Mm. How would Mm. I know? You're just, you know. So there's that. On top of his family leaving and on top of everybody asking about that all the time, I get a call from my dad one night and the elders are questioning us again if we had sex before we got married. So my dad calls and he's like, listen, I already know you're going to say no. I know your answer. I know you didn't do it. But I have to ask you because they're asking me, did you guys have sex before you got married? And I was like, no, who is saying this? Who is who is doing this again? I've been married over a year now. Can we just drop it. Like, Mm. you know what I mean? It's exhausting. So, um, it turns out that I guess somebody had gotten in trouble for messing around and they said that they thought it was okay because they saw us do it. And I'm like, so they threw you under the bus because they wanted the bus and we got in trouble again. Um, well in trouble talk to, Mm. yeah. Um, so at this point we're both just kind of like done, like without saying it, because we were couldn't say it, we we weren't doing this anymore. We weren't going to meetings. We weren't, um, you know, we were in a different congregation from my parents, so they didn't know if we were going to meeting or not. So I kind of ended up, I regret it now because it was really hard. But I kind of ended up just not speaking to my parents unless I had to for a while. I was avoiding them because I didn't want them to know that we weren't going to meeting. Mm. Um, and. We, we ended up moving halls a couple times, trying to find a place that we liked where we could fit in and, and everything. And it just wasn't working. So we were totally inactive for a while. I don't know how many months. I mean, this oh, all- just to give us a, an idea of how recent this was. Can you give us an idea of what, yeah. what year, what year this was? So, um, we split up right after this, we split up in 2019. So this right. would have been about 2019. Right. Um, so that's, not that long ago just before the pandemic just before yeah so 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 just before that's right so just before the pandemic um like a week or two before our two-year anniversary we split up um it was just the most awful thing in the whole world um because as a witness you know divorce is like not an option so I'm like scared to death I'm like this is it my life is over you know what I mean I'm like 20 years old and I'm, what do I do? I have nothing. You know what I mean? And so he, it, you know, he just came home and he looked at me and I, I looked at him and I, I just knew what was coming. And I said, are you leaving? And he said, yes. And so I, I didn't know what to do. I called my dad because my dad's the one that I call for everything. So my dad, you know, he picked me up and he, you know, well, he was, I forget to say this. He, my whole family was in New York at the time visiting Bethel, ironically. Mm, okay. So I'm here. My husband just left me. Um, and my whole family's gone. So I call my dad. He's, he's helping me. He's, he's helping me get up off the floor and pack my bags, you know, cause I'm just a mess because again, divorce is not an option. 
I'm going to be looked at so horribly for this because this is not an option. I'm a witness. This is not supposed to happen. So I pack my bags. I have nowhere to go. So I go to my parents' house and nobody's there. They're all in New York visiting Bethel. So I call the elders because that's what I'm supposed to do. I don't have anywhere else to go. So I call the elders and I remember, I remember I just told him what had happened. I said, you know, Eli's gone and I don't know what to do. And I remember he said, well, tonight's the meeting. You really should make sure you're at the meeting. And I'm crying and I'm telling him, I'm like, I I don't think I can even like put meeting clothes on and get out of bed. Like I, I can't do this. I just need help. I just need somebody to help me. And he's like, okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll get some brothers to call you, but you really should be a meeting tonight. And I was like, I'll try. And then we hung up the phone. Um, so I think it was, I think it was the next day. I don't think it was that night. I think it was the next day that I got a call from two brothers who later were on my husband's judicial committee. They were assigned to help me, which they did not do. Um, they called me and I was alone in the house. Just, I, it, it was horrible. I, I was having a very hard time, mm. um, which may seem dramatic to some people, but I was having an extremely hard time. And so I call these, well, they call me and I'm, I'm crying and I'm asking them, please, can somebody come over here? Like, can both of you come over here or can your wives come over or can you find somebody to come over and just like be with me? Cause I'm like, I was afraid to be by myself. I was afraid what I might do. I don't, I know. Oh, I can't okay. Okay. Yeah. Too, but yeah. I was afraid that I wasn't going to be here anymore if I right. be by myself, um, which is terrifying you're in a house by yourself and you're having these horrible thoughts. So I'm, I'm, I'm asking them for help. I'm crying. And I'm, he, one of the brothers, I will never forget it. He said, okay, you need to get a grip. Stop crying. That's what he said. And it shocked me. (laughs) And so I stopped crying. I was like, okay, uh, this man's not a safe space. I can't cry around him. Like we're done. I'll, I'll shut up. Fine. So I stopped crying and, um, Basically, they read a few scriptures and that was it. Nobody came over and I was alone um, till my parents got home. I had, you know, a, a person, I had one sister stop by, um, which I love that sister and I wish, I, I wish the best for her and I miss her very mm. much. But, um, mm. you know, the elders who were supposed to be the ones helping me, I was begging for help and they didn't i told them i was afraid what would happen did they at any point um suggest that you approach mental health services not once no um which was really hard um so i you know the hardest part goes by a few weeks go by my parents come home i get all my things out of the house he moves we're we're officially separated and i'm trying to move on you know, so I'm not speaking to him at all. I don't have his phone number. I don't know where he lives. I don't know anything. He's just gone. Um, and I'm with my parents. So I'm, I'm trying to distract myself by being a super good witness. I'm trying to get really involved, even though I, now I realize deep down, I, I, I didn't want to, I didn't have anything else. I'm like, this is what I have. This is what I have spent my whole life doing. I might as well just keep going. Cause I don't know what else to do. I mean, So I kept going. I was going to every meeting. I was, you know, being a great witness and everything um, because I didn't have anywhere else to go. So then during all of that, I think it started um, kind of coming forward that I didn't actually want to be a witness, but I wasn't saying it because I went out and got my first tattoo, which which is like, you know, a no, no, that's really, a no, no for really Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah, 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 for sure. So it was hidden. It was right here on my rib cage, um, and I got it because of what had happened with me and my husband. You know, it's a very sentimental thing. And anyway, so I got this tattoo. It's hidden. I'm still being a really good witness and going to all the meetings, I'm going out in service. I'm, you know, doing all that stuff. And anyways, like four months goes by, and um, one night. I don't remember how, but I had gotten my husband's current phone number 
Uh, my him and my dad worked at the same company. That's how it happened. And my dad had his number for work purposes. So I ended up getting that number. I don't remember how, but I did. And I told my parents one night, I was like, hey, I'm going to go go out and get some food. And they're like, okay. So I get in my car and I call Eli, which I hadn't done in four months. And I call him and he answered the phone. <laughs> and I didn't know what to say because I didn't think he was going to answer. I just thought it was going to ring and then I was going to hang up and cry and be sad for a minute and move on. But he answered. And I just was like, hey, you know, can we talk? Can we meet up or something? Can, you know, and he's like, okay, you know, so he came and picked me up. My parents think I'm out getting food. Um, so I felt like I was doing something bad, but I was married to this man. So technically yeah. it was okay. Technically it's all never, good. Yeah. I had yeah. never done anything like that. You know, this guy's coming to my house to pick me up and like, it's weird. And it felt very wrong. It felt wrong and it shouldn't have, but it did. Um, mm. So he picked me up and we talked and, um, you know, ended up working things out and everything was, everything wasn't okay, but we were willing to work on it and make it okay. Um, so very quickly people found out that we were back together and they were not happy about it. Um, I had a lot of people send me messages, call me. I had a sister um, take me to Starbucks because she wanted to sit down and, and talk. And I was like, okay. So we went to Starbucks, we sat down and talked. Um, and the whole time she was just telling me that I was going to ruin my life if I took him back that we were, we could be pretty sure that he already cheated on me so I could leave him. Like I could leave and I could get a divorce and it would be biblical and it's fine. Don't take him back. You know, she was telling me that he's a narcissist because she's one of those people that likes to overuse that word. Um, so it was just awful. And I remember that woman, I, I cry a lot. Apparently I'm realizing how much I'm saying I cried in this story. It was very rough four months. I don't cry that often. <laughs> No, I think it's understandable given what you're describing. Yeah. Right. No this one's judging was... you for crying in that situation. Yeah. So we're in the middle of a Starbucks and this woman is. You're crying over your frappuccino. Out. Yeah. Yeah. Crying over my coffee. And, you yeah. know, so it was just, it was just really awful. People were very upset with me for taking mm. him back. And, and it confused me because it's none of their business. And I thought people would be happy that I was going to take my husband back because we're witnesses for God's sake. You're supposed to make your marriage work. You know what I mean? I think marriage is supposed to be sacred. Yeah. And, but and, people, and, yeah, that was out the window because people kept telling me, Oh, we could be sure. I'm sure he already slept with somebody. I'm sure he did. So you could get a divorce. You should just get mm -hmm. a divorce. You should divorce him. You know? And I'm like, I don't want to like, I don't feel like he did what he did because he wanted to, we were having a hard time because of this, like, this mm -hmm. is not him which now is proven because we've been married almost six years and our marriage is a million times better than it was before. So right. I truly am supposed to be married to this man. Like we had a bump in the road because of people meddling in our life. Mm. So he ends up, um, I don't know how he did it because he ended up going to the elders to confess everything that he did while he was separated from me. And, um, I waited in the car during his judicial meeting because I don't know why I just wanted to go with him and I knew I couldn't go inside. So I just sat in the car. I, I couldn't go in my, I didn't want to hang out with my parents cause we weren't really on good terms cause they didn't want me to get back with Eli either. So I just sat in the car and me and Eli go back and forth all the time about how long his judicial meeting was, but it was very long. I remember sitting in the car for at least three hours. I, I would say close to four hours. Eli says that's wrong, but it was at least three hours. I sat in the car. And could have done with a caravan instead of a car, yeah, couldn't you? Some yeah, kind of trailer like situation. Had a with me or something. Like I was four, bored out of my mind. Four hours in a car is pretty brutal when it when it's not moving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And when yeah. you're scared to death because your husband yeah. getting disfellowed, it's it's terrifying. If you need me, I'll be in my trailer. Yeah. 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 So that's, it, yeah. It was awful. So we're waiting. He comes out, um, 
they, they, he tells me that he's going to be disfellowshipped and whatever. And he tells me that these questions they're asking him were just really awkward and awful. And for some reason, they were stuck on the fact that they're like, did you sleep with any guys? And my husband's straight. So I don't know where they'd get that idea, but they were stuck on that. They asked him over and over and over and over. Are you sure you didn't sleep with any men? Are you sure you didn't sleep with any men? And he's like, no, I'm straight. He's like, you know, people want to do that. That's their business. But I don't, I'm straight. He's like, I didn't sleep with any men. Why are they so fixated on that? It was, it was odd. And then, you know, the whole, I'm sure your viewers have watched your other videos and they know about judicial meetings and the questions that get asked, but he was asked every uncomfortable question, you know, did he like it? What was he wearing? What was she wearing? Blah, blah, blah. Like all those things. I'm sure it was just beyond uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, so he's asked all these questions and, and everything. Um, so I, one of the brothers ended up calling me to tell me, Hey, you know, Eli is going to be disfellowshipped. I'm sure he told you. And I was like, yeah, I just, I, I really feel like he's sorry. I know he's sorry. And I said, I know he's repentant. I know he is, you know? And then the, the brother said to me, we know he's repentant. He said that he said, we know he's repentant, but because of how it looks and because of how many people know we have to disfellowship him. So it's not about actual repentance. It's about how things look. Yeah. And what's yeah. a good look for the outcome yeah. in the, yeah, And okay. I wrote that, yeah. I wrote that in my disassociation letter. Yeah. Said, this, this elder, and I'm not going to say his name here, but this elder told me that they knew he was repentant and they still disfellowshipped him because of how it looks. That is mm. not how you brothers are instructed to handle that situation. Yeah. I yeah. was furious. Once I realized, once I stepped away and realized what actually happened, I can't tell you how mad I was. It was, mm. it was just beyond ridiculous. Um, so, you know, my husband gets disfellowshipped and now people are treating me like I'm disfellowshipped, which I'm, I was a young sister in the hall whose husband had just left her. You would think that I would be someone that people would have gathered around and helped and been concerned about and been there for. They well, Jehovah's not. Witnesses famously have the love that never fails. Yeah. So you, you yeah. presumably would have been surrounded by warm embraces. That's how it's supposed to go. Yeah. 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 Uh, so now I'm a young sister with a disfellowshipped husband, mm. which is extremely hard. It's extremely, extremely hard. And nobody's helping me. Nobody asks me to hang out anymore. Nobody wants to go in service with me. People are canceling their service plans with me. People, um, you know, everything. People are treating me like I'm disfellowshipped. So, um, you know, we, we kind of just start fading off again because it's too hard to go. We don't want to go. And then COVID starts happening at this point. So we're doing meetings on Zoom. It's really easy to just not do it. You know what I mean? Because it's not like you have to necessarily get dressed and get in your car and go to the meeting. If you don't want to do it, you just don't do it. You know what I mean? Who's going to question you? Nobody's talking to me anyways. Let's see if they even know I'm missing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we stopped going. Surprise, nobody cared that I was not there. Nobody reached out to me. Nobody talked to me. Um, and it was just, pardon my language, but the shittiest feeling in the whole entire world. I felt like these people who cared about me so much, just I'm nothing anymore. And mm. I didn't even do anything wrong. Yeah. My husband, <laughs> sorry, Eli, if you're watching, my husband left me. Mm. I didn't do anything. And people are well, even people. before you got married, you were being yeah. accused of doing yes. things that you hadn't done. Yes. So, yeah, yes. yeah. So, um, yeah, we're back together. We, we're we fixing our problems. You know, things are great, but we're not going to meetings. Um, so we kind of slowly start doing like worldly things. You know, I have a job that I love. I managed a store on the town square out here is a really cute store. I loved my job. I loved the girls that, that, that worked with me. And so I got really involved in that, you know, and stopped so much with the witnesses and, 
um, you know, my husband, because he's already disfellowshipped, he's just kind of realizing how hard it is to try to come back nearly impossible. Um, so anyways, we're, we're not going to meetings. We're, we're going to bars, you know, we're going to birthday parties. We're, we're doing all these things, lots of other worldly things that I won't mention on here that aren't bad, but the witnesses consider it bad. Um, which makes me feel extremely guilty. I'm having fun when I'm doing it, but I go home at the end of the night and I'm having a panic attack and I'm freaking out because I'm going to die at Armageddon is what right. I can't. This is it. I, was oh that- no, I went to a birthday party. There's a fireball with my name on it. Yeah. 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 Like I, I, I'm going to die. Like, yeah. Hope I had fun at that party. Cause that's the last one. Like I'm not doing mm. this. And so I'd go to a party, a birthday party or a bar or whatever. And then I'd go to the meeting and I'd study for the meeting really well. And I'd put on my dress clothes and I'd sit on my couch and do the zoom meeting and just cry the whole time because I felt so extremely guilty because I've disappointed Jehovah. I've disappointed my family, you know? So, um, because of that, my mental health got so horrible. Um, you know, I, I, there's no shame in taking medication for mental health. Let me say that I'm doing it. And I think if you need it, you should do it. But I was on a good amount of medications because I was having such a hard time. I started going to therapy for like the first time. And, um, that was the first time that I think I admitted out loud that I didn't want to do this anymore. Um, so my therapist, I just remember her asking me, she was like, what do you think is the main cause of stress in your life? And I got ready to answer. And she said, hang on. She wrote something down in her notebook. And then she asked me again, what's the main cause of stress in your life? And I very reluctantly answered religion. She turned her notebook around and she had written that I was going to say religion. And I just lost <laughs> <laughs> because I had never admitted that being a witness was not good for me. And I finally admitted it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, going from that, I had start started saying that I, I didn't think the witnesses were a cult, but they have a lot of similarities to cults, you know, things like that. And then I finally admitted that I thought it was a cult. And I finally admitted this and this and this and this and this. And I haven't told anyone this outside of my therapist. So it's, terrifying you know going home because I'm like wow I just said all that stuff and now I got to go home and face my family who's witnesses so one day I call my dad and here comes the car ride that we were talking about I call my dad and I said hey I'm having kind of a hard time can can we go on a drive can we talk and he's like sure sounds great so he came to my house and he picked me up and we talked about our day. We talked about work. We talked about whatever, because I think both of us were reluctant to get into this conversation. And finally it happened. And, um, my dad said to me, he said, you know, don't tell your mom this. Cause I haven't said this to her yet. And I, I want to tell her myself, but he's like, I don't think that any of us really know who God is. I don't think we know who or what God is. And I just, this is the part where, okay, I'm like having an out-of-body experience because I'm looking out the window and I'm like, okay, okay, don't panic. Why did he say that? What does he mean by that? Does he mean what I think he means? Because if he does, this is okay. Like, I'm going to say the same thing and it's okay. So I was like, I, I don't remember exactly what I said, but basically, yeah, I totally agree. And I don't agree with this fellowshipping is what I said. I was like, you can't imagine the effect that this has had on Eli. And he said the same thing. He's like, I don't agree with this fellowshipping either. Blah, blah, blah. You know, so we just kind of. It's like you both, it's like you both sat there, like with, with these cards and you're kind of trying not to show your hand yes. too much, but yeah. you're in this weird kind of negotiating you situation. Find yeah. The cards on the table and it's all open. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was very, very stressful and exciting and relieving, but mm. also the opposite of relieving because now I'm like, Oh shit, I got to talk to my husband about this eventually because, you know, so, um, 
um sorry i have my notes here my story is very intertwined i'm trying to not miss oh, so I, I appreciate um, you you being as accurate as possible yeah that's <laughs> that's brilliant because um, it, it is a, a yeah it's, it's a very intertwined um complicated story i think is how we would right. describe it yeah so um my therapist helped me come to terms with with everything and and um so my husband in the midst of all this becomes a tattoo artist which is like the most horrible thing you could do as a witness <laughs> yeah so, it's like apostate witch doctor tattoo artist for isn't sure it? for sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah. so he becomes a tattoo artist he's an apprentice he's working in a tattoo shop and I'm his first tattoo client as an apprentice so I go and I get this lovely little tattoo oh, fantastic um yeah. and I'm getting to the point where I just don't care what people think, really. I'm doing these bad things, and I suddenly don't feel so guilty for it anymore. So I got my nose pierced, and then I got this tattoo. And, um, of course, I posted it on social media. I'm like, look at this amazing job my husband did. I'm so proud of him. He's an apprentice at this tattoo shop. Go see him. Like, you know, shouting my husband out. Like, he's doing a great job. Look at his work. And oh my gosh, Lloyd, you would not believe I got the nastiest comments and messages from people. Um, I had a woman who, a, a sister who I don't even know. I know her through social media and we have acquaintances, but I've never actually even met this woman. She comments that I'm a despicable human being and Jehovah is ashamed of me, and how dare I, and all this stuff, and I was just shocked. I knew that I was going to get something, but I didn't know it was going to be like that, and so I just delete the comment, block her, and move on. It keeps happening. I'm getting texts. Finally, my, my aunt, who I love so much, but we're not seeing eye to eye because she's a witness, but I, I just love her dearly, but she sent me a message She's like, hey, Ty, did you, did I see that you got a tattoo? You know, and, and all this stuff. And I think, I don't remember. I think I just didn't answer her because I, I just knew what she was going to say. And I, I didn't want to argue with her. I didn't want to do this. Um, so, you know, pretty much from there, it's just a hard fade away. I'm gone. I'm done. Nobody notices really, except for when I do something bad and they all attack me. Um, well, it seems they were attacking you even when you weren't doing things bad. So yeah. it would be almost strange, wouldn't it? If, if, if yeah. you were to do something that's against their rules and they were, they were to be fine with it, you know? Yeah. So, so it's I'm, one of those I'm, things where if they're going to persecute you, even when you're doing everything right, you might as well, you do know, it. you may as well go the, the full way. Yeah. 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 So I'm out. I'm doing what I want. I'm getting all kinds of tattoos and living my life. And, um, I found out I was pregnant. Um, so that was amazing. I was home by myself one morning and I just thought I needed to take a pregnancy test and I did, and I found out I was pregnant. So it was amazing. Um, but I think getting pregnant is what really pushed me to, make it official and leave. Like I was fine, just kind of like floating around mm. technically being a witness, but not being a witness. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, but having a kid, I wanted my son as far as possible from these people who have hurt me so badly. Um, yeah. so I'm, let's see, it was February 20, 22 last year mm -hmm. sorry I get my years mixed up the older I get man I'm like I can't remember if it's 2022 or 2023 right now it was 2022 mm. uh, I had my son in April so I was very pregnant <laughs> I sat on the couch and I wrote my letter and um basically I just in my letter said all the little issues that I had and well, they're not little issues. They're big. But I said all the issues that I had. And then I said that I didn't want any pity for this. I don't want to talk. I've made up my mind. I already know that you guys are going to try to get me to come back. You feel sorry for me because I've made the wrong choice or whatever. My mind is set. I'm done. I'm leaving. 
here's my phone number. Please text me when this has been announced at the meeting, because I won't mm. be there. I want to know that it's been announced, but I'm not mm. coming and I don't want to talk to you guys about it. Yeah. And, um, you know, that, that, that was it. And, and here I am now I have a, a toddler and we just celebrated his first birthday, which was literally the most magical thing in the whole world. Yeah. Wow. I feel like yeah. it was, I was like vicariously living through my child. I just, you know, singing mm. him happy birthday. We had Christmas last year. I got to set up a Christmas tree. My dad came, my, my dad came to our Christmas. My, my mom came and it was so nice to have her there. Um, even though she's still in, um, mm. it means the world to me that she still chooses to come to these things. I don't want to cry, but she yeah. it's, I know that it's hard for her to, to come to these things and that she's probably, if people are talking to her, um, she's probably going to get a lot of backlash for it because she's hanging out with her apostate daughter, which I'm mm. very loud about it. I'm not a quiet apostate. I scream it. I post it all over the internet, any video I come across, I'm sharing it. You know, I have, anti-witnessing stickers that I put, <laughs> I put out. Like I have one on my fridge when people come over, I'm very loud about it. So I know that I'm not making things easy on her, but I hope that, I hope that she sees that life is good out here and that she wants to join us. And the fact that she's coming to Christmases and Thanksgivings and birthdays, you know, is just amazing. So. Well, it's clear that her humanity outweighs her her devotion to yeah. the organization because um she obviously loves you very much yeah and i'm kind of envious of you in that regard because you know i have a parent who's yeah. who doesn't have that much humanity quite yeah. sadly and uh, quite I, frankly, I, and, I yeah. recognize how lucky i am for sure my yeah. my parents i hear all the time from people how amazing my parents are and i when my dad's interview was posted I just woke up to a flood of messages. People, I watched your dad's video. Your dad's so amazing. And, you know, I'm, I'm probably embarrassing him right now, but it's... It, it, I, really I, to be honest, I want your dad as my dad. I, I, I'm willing to fight this he, out. He we, is, need to have a, we need to have a showdown. Yes, have a battle. <laughs> fight yeah. for my dad. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. but really, truly, I, I recognize how lucky I am because I know a lot of people who have left. It has not gone this way for them. And so I think the reason that I'm so loud about it is because those people need someone to fight for them. Those yeah. need somebody to be loud and be their family because their family is not here for them, which is just heartbreaking. So, yeah, but presumably having your dad at your side has, has made the last few months way more tolerable for you oh than they God. otherwise would have been. Yeah, yeah. it would have been hell. Yeah. And it's not been enjoyable. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. Leaving is the hardest thing I've ever done. But my my dad has, my dad's the only person in my life that has ever truly a hundred million percent accepted me for whatever I am. Mm -hmm. I could wake up one day and shave all my hair off and say I'm worshiping aliens and he'd be like that's great I love you keep going like it, we'll save that for another video but yeah yeah, go on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so he's yeah. just really truly both my parents are are great and I'm sure my mm. brother will talk a whole lot about that when you interview him so. yeah 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 so um cats out of the bag we're gonna do the whole family yes, uh, <laughs> and and your brother's up next uh so viewers look out for that but um, Ty, what a heartwarming story. And, you know, considering how much you, you've been through, I, I mean, so there'll be some people who will be will be saying, well, you know, this is this is extreme. And certainly the way you were treated, um, even before you'd done anything that was against the rules, uh, was, was almost a caricature of of, of what you know the the religion itself of the, how the religion itself presents itself but you know arguably the minute you have uh, such a rule oriented uh, patriarchal religion where every single action that a person takes is scrutinized and and people's lives are micromanaged it's inevitable that people will have stories like yours and uh, the fact that you've been able to come through uh, such darkness and such despair and and be here now 
um, able to talk about it all speaks to an incredible inner strength. So uh, thank you very much indeed. And I'm wondering whether you have any messages to people who might be uh, still on the fence as to whether they you know, need to get out of the organization or not. What would be your message to them? Yeah, I do, because I was on that fence for a very long time. Mm. Um, there are people out here. <laughs> the world is not as bad as the witnesses make it sound. And I know that there's a lot of bad things going on in the world, but I, I really truly believe that the world is a, a good place. I have met some of the most amazing people since I've left. And the the XJW community is insanely supportive. Every community has its has its people, you know, but but truly I the love that you have, you know, the witnesses say they have the worldwide brotherhood. Guess what? It's out here too. And the XJWs have it too. And there's people out here. So don't be afraid to leave. You know, I understand it's hard to give up your family. Um, but never lose hope that they'll come with you because mine did. And I know that that's not everybody's case, but it can happen. Sometimes one person leaving is all it takes for a chain reaction to start and everybody to go. So just, just be the one to start that. Be the one that starts the domino effect and just do it because it's going to have a good effect for you and your future family and everybody around you. So just just do it. Just do it. <laughs> just do it. <laughs> do it. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, very inspiring words. Thank you so much, Ty. Again, uh, you're an incredibly strong woman, and I'm sure my viewers will draw a huge amount of inspiration from your story. So thank you. Thank you. Viewers, I hope you've enjoyed this interview. Why wouldn't you? Uh, don't forget that you can watch similar videos and the follow-up interview involving Ty's brother, uh, by subscribing to or at least following the Lloyd Evans channel, but that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for watching.